January 1945, Auschwitz-Birkenau in occupied Poland. The end is near as the Red Army approaches, but that does not mean an end to the suffering of the tens of thousands still alive at the biggest Nazi concentration and extermination camp complex they have created. The last days of Auschwitz will show that even faced with imminent defeat, the Nazis are determined to finish their genocide. This is episode 126 of War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. As the new year comes around at the camp complex and its subcamps, uh, Commandant SS Hauptsturmführer Josef Kama has left the camp to take over at Bergen-Belsen. Formally, he is still in charge, but operationally, it is the Commandant of Auschwitz I, SS Sturmbannführer Richard Baer, who is heading operations. Despite the approaching Red Army in the east, Baer is still operating the camp complex as usual, with the addition that he's also following Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler order from November to begin destroying evidence of the mass murders, including the crematoria and gas chambers. In early January, Himmler sends the camp commanders the message that the Führer holds you personally responsible for making sure that not a single prisoner from the concentration camps falls alive into the hands of the enemy. Baer begins preparations to evacuate or kill all the inmates before the Soviets arrive, if they arrive. Since December 1st, 1944, the SS has been shipping out building materials and valuables from the Canada Depot, the warehouses where the personal effects stolen from the murdered are stored, sending them to various camp complexes inside the Reich itself. On January 5th, another Gestapo summary court proceeding takes place at Block 11. 70 Polish men and women accused of resistance activities are condemned to death. They are taken to now defunct Crematorium 5 and shot. Several of them have carved their names in the walls of their cells with the request that someone inform their relatives of their fate. Their court proceedings will be the last to take place at Auschwitz. On January 6th, the day that Ella Gartner, Roger Robota, Regina Safir and Estera Weisblum, who supported the October uprising, are hanged, 1,004 female prisoners are sent to Bergen-Belsen. This is a regular train transfer. Evacuations have not yet begun. In the following days, the situation in the camp deteriorates with more and more prisoners dying from exhaustion, malnutrition and disease every day. January 13th, the Red Army launches its massive Western offensive. January 14th, in the women's camp in section B2E, three boys are born. Their exact fate is unknown, but they will not survive. January 15th, Single or small groups of prisoners are still arriving at the camp transferred from other camps. A U.S. reconnaissance plane observes that the IG Farben plant near Auschwitz is close to being fully repaired from previous bombings and is in most parts operational. That same day, the camp command orders more effort put into the repairs at the neighboring Bunawerke. The same day, the final shipment of valuables from the Canada Depot leaves to Camp Großrosen. In six weeks, millions of plundered items have been shipped out. Clothing alone makes up for one million of the items packed into 95,000 crates. At the crematoria in Birkenau, 70 inmates of the Sonderkommando under orders of Commando 104B, tasked with eradicating the evidence of the gas chambers, are demounting cremation and gassing equipment. The parts are loaded on a train and sent to the Großhosen camp. That evening, the Sonderkommandos are ordered to drill holes in the walls of the crematoria and gas chambers. The holes are intended for explosives to blow up the facility if the Red Army should approach the camp. January 16th. Death rates among inmates continue to climb. The Allies bomb Javorzno, also hitting the Auschwitz subcamp Neudax, killing several inmates. January 17th. The SS forced the prisoners in all camps and subcamps into the yards for a roll call. It will be the last of its sort. In the main camp and immediate subcamps, there are 15,317 male and 16,557 female prisoners. In the peripheral subcamps, there are 33,023 male and 2,095 female prisoners. In total, 66,992. 
Most are adult and adolescent men and women, and a few hundred are children. In addition to them is at least one infant hidden in the camp. She is Angela Otvos Bein. On January 27th, only hours before the Red Army liberates the camp, Angela's mother, Veronika, will help an also pregnant friend deliver a son, Georgi Faludi. Of the hundreds of children born in Auschwitz, Georgi and Angela are the only two to be known to have survived. Shortly after the roll call, the evacuations of the subcamps begin. Prisoners who are too weak or sick to walk are left behind or shot. The evacuees are given meager road rations. At the Sosnitz, it's three potatoes and two pieces of cheese that will have to sustain them for 16 days of evacuation, 14 of which will be on foot. In the main camp, Dr. Josef Mengele destroys his laboratory, collects the records of his human experimentation on twins, and then evacuates to Berlin. Across the camp, the other SS doctors destroy all their medical records. The leaders of the camp resistance, Josef Sirankiewicz and Stanislav Kodwinski, smuggle out their final message to the relief committee for inmates of the concentration camps in Krakow. Dear friends, so now we are evacuating. Chaos, panic among the SS, drunkards. With all political means, we are trying to make the departure as bearable as possible and to protect those allegedly to be left behind from extermination. Such intentions were and are possibly still at hand without any doubt. We need radio propaganda. An evacuation like this will mean the extermination of at least half of the inmates. Controls by the Red Cross are needed and during the interregnum in the camp, mandatory to avoid that some SS special unit arrives to mow down all the sick. We attach a number of documents. The documents, those they've already sent, and the ones they and other inmates have buried in watertight containers around the camp, will provide the world with a detailed day-by-day record of the Nazi crimes at Auschwitz-Birkenau and its subcamps. On January 18th, the last prisoner registered at Auschwitz, Engelbert Makech, arrives from Mauthausen and is assigned number 202,499. He is a convicted felon that is passing through on his way to join the Dielewanger SS Penal Brigade. As he arrives, columns of 500 each with women and children are being marched out of the women's camp and adjacent subcamps. 4,428 women and girls and 169 boys too weak to evacuate are confined to the quarantine camp in section B2E. Column after column from the men's camp soon follow the women and children. At 1 a.m. January 19th, the last large column with 2,500 prisoners leaves Auschwitz-Birkenau under supervision of one of the last remaining higher SS officers, Obersturmführer Wilhelm Reichenbeck. By January 20th, Camp Commandant Baer and many of the SS men have left the Auschwitz camp itself, but several units remain nearby. Many of them have discarded their uniforms and are dressed in civilian clothing taken from the Canada warehouses and have locked the gates in the parts of the camp they have abandoned. Even if they would have left the gates open, few would be able to escape as most prisoners left behind are too weak or too sick to move. One of the SS men returns with freshly slaughtered poultry and a piglet. He orders some female prisoners to cook lunch for the SS men. Just as they sit down to eat, they are ordered to start retreating immediately, which they do, leaving most of their food untouched. Some of the less weakened men and women decide to use the opportunity to flee. They manage to break open the gate to Section B2E, get into the SS command rooms, and in anger start demolishing the interior. Soon, one of them notices a new group of SS men approaching. They flee back into the camp. The new group enters the women's barracks in B2E and order all Jewish women outside. Some 200 emerge into the yard. They are taken outside the gates and murdered by gunfire. At the men's sick barracks in B2F, a group of inmates are ordered to carry boxes of dynamite to the already partly demolished crematoria 2 and 3. Men from the SS group then blow up the two crematoria before leaving the camp. By the end of January 21st, the main and most subcamps have been evacuated. Some 60,000 already starving, emaciated men, women and children have been walked out into the freezing winter with temperatures reaching 20 degrees Celsius below zero, dressed in little more than pajamas and without adequate food and protection. They will be forced to sleep under open skies and walk for days on end until tens of thousands of them have died or been shot by the SS guards for straggling. We don't 
have exact numbers for the entire death marches, but for instance, out of the 800 march out of the Yanina Grube subcamp, only 200 will arrive exhausted and near death at their destination, Koshosen. Back at the camp, the few remaining SS men are still trying to destroy the evidence of their crimes and yet continue their murder sprees. Across the camps, heaps of dead prisoners shot for being too weak to evacuate, for being Jewish or just for sport are strewn around. At the Gleivitz 4 subcamp, SS man Otto Lech and Organisation Tod employee Gustav Günther lock 57 sick prisoners into the hospital barrack and set it on fire. Anyone trying to flee the flames through the windows is machine gunned. Only two victims survive by hiding under the corpses. At the Shechowitz vacuum subcamp, a group of men from Organisation Tod order left behind prisoners unable to march to bury the corpses strewn about the camp. When the pits are dug and the corpses carry there, the Totmen leave. A few hours later, a group of SS men arrive. They proceed to the medical barracks and shoot all bedridden prisoners. The men who had dug the pits are ordered to carry the dead there too. As they dump the last corpses into the pit, the SS men open fire on the gravediggers, pour gasoline on the pile of corpses, and set it on fire. As the dead burn, the SS men go through the camp to find any prisoners who have managed to hide and shoot them too. Only five men managed to escape the bullets. Meanwhile, at the gates of death that lead to the crematoria at Birkenau, five women try to flee. A drunken auxiliary guard halts them and orders a young woman into the watchtower, intending to rape her. Her companions hear two gunshots, and seconds later the girl emerges unscathed. She has taken the guard's pistol and executed him. After hiding for a few hours in heaps of down they find in one of the train wagons abandoned at the selection ramp, the women return to the camp. There, other prisoners have used the absence of the SS to begin raiding the left-behind food stores. With enough food to last the inmates for at least a week, they open up the kitchens again. Two men have gotten their hands on guns and fire celebratory shots in the air. Men of a nearby Wehrmacht unit hear the shots and report it to SD men in the area, who promptly go to the camp and search the barracks, but soon leave when they can't find any guns. Before they go, a capo, Otto Schulz, tells them that the shots were fired by a Russian POW, Andreev. Along the paths of the death marches, locals are now collecting corpses and burying them in mass graves. On January 20th alone, along one road section in Silesia, 223 male and 39 female succumbed or shot prisoners are collected and buried in one grave. On January 22nd, several columns of prisoners evacuated from Auschwitz arrive at the subcamp Gleiwitz. They are loaded onto open rail cars, where in the freezing temperatures they are transported in a series of departures leaving from Buchenwald, Großhausen, Sachsenhausen and Mauthausen. During the transport, many of them die of exposure and exhaustion. The last of several columns of evacuees from Auschwitz arriving at Bodyschlav in Silesia are marched into the train station. At 11 p.m., they too are loaded onto open rail cars, 100 per wagon. They are forced to spend the night on the train at the station guarded by SS men. At dawn, the survivors are sent towards Mauthausen. The transport takes more than two days. Again, many of them succumb. The same afternoon at Auschwitz, an SS contingent arrives at Camp Section B2F and forces the prisoners there to collect any and all murdered Soviet POW and bring them to Crematorium 5, where in the evening the SS men burn the corpses on a giant pyre. Then the SS men set fire to 30 of the barracks in the personal effects depot and leave. The prisoners at B2F set up a fire watch to make sure that the raging inferno doesn't spread to the nearby inmate hospital barracks. The fire will burn for five days. January 23rd, transports with prisoners continue to arrive at their final destination. At Buchenwald, 916 mostly Jewish Hungarians and Poles. In Ravensbrück, several hundred, among them 520 Polish women from the Warsaw Uprising arrests. New transports by rail are still also leaving the collection points at the subcamps, like from Laura Hütte, the camp personnel flee on the same train. At one section along the rails, dozens of corpses lay along the line, dressed in the typical striped concentration camp pajamas. They are probably from a transport from subcamp Gunter Grube that passed through a few days earlier. The inmates from Laura Hütte are forced off the train to undress the corpses and collect their eating bowls. When they are done, the train continues towards Mauthausen in Austria. 134 inmates die on the journey. January 24th. 
The system of capos and organized terror of the SS has disintegrated, and in that vacuum, the camp has descended into chaos. Prisoner doctor Irina Konietzna, who has served as a doctor in the women's camp hospital, has hid among the sick to avoid being evacuated so that she can care for her patients. She will remember. There were no more SS guard posts to be seen, only individual SS men who came into the grounds of the camp. I also heard that groups of SS men entered the camp sporadically and shot many Jewish women. I would refer to the period before the arrival of the first lines of the Soviet troops as an interregnum. Total anarchy reigned in the camp. No one obeyed anyone or showed any respect for the previous prisoner functionaries. No one carried corpses out of the block, and no one cleaned up the filth. The prisoners required treatment and food, but there was a lack of willing hands to look after them. Some prisoners managed to bring some food products back from the SS warehouses and tried to prepare hot meals. Together with several fellow prisoners, including Dr. Sarah Marianette, I bent over backwards to help the greatest possible number of bedridden patients, in terms of both medical care and food. We tried to keep up the spirits of all our fellow prisoners so that they would not give up, but rather hold out until the moment when they returned to their families. One of the returning SS men on this day, contrary to what he will later claim, is SS Sturmbannführer Kraus. Together with some other SS men, for whatever reason, he murders three inmates in the kitchen barracks. January 25th. In Berlin, the head of Amtsgruppe D in the SS Main Economic and Administrative Office, under whose responsibility is Auschwitz, is awarded the German Cross in silver for his excellent work managing 15 large concentration camps with over 500 subcamps, 40,000 SS men, and 750,000 prisoners. In the camp, an SS unit arrives and orders all Jewish prisoners in the women's camp in section B2E and the men's in B2F to exit the barracks. Many have now discarded their yellow Star of David, but Capo Schultz shows the SS men which prisoners are Jewish. Some manage to hide under loose floorboards in the barracks they have prepared for this eventuality. The 200 women and 150 men are marched out of the camp. Some, seemingly at random, are taken behind the barracks and murdered on the way out, and any stragglers are shot on the spot. The remaining continue the march until a passing car with the SS men halts the transport. Words are exchanged between the SS men, and the prisoners are suddenly ordered to return to the main camp, while the SS depart in haste. Soon a new SS unit arrives at the main camp and forces all prisoners out of the barracks to the gates with the infamous words Arbeit macht frei. The prisoners are separated into three parts. At the front, Reich Germans, behind them non-Jewish non-Germans, and at the back, Jewish prisoners. It is clear that they are to be murdered. But then another car drives up with the SS officers. Again, a short exchange of words, and again the prisoners are ordered back to the barracks while the SS unit flees. January 26th. At 1 a.m., the last still-standing crematorium, number 5, including its gas chambers, is blown up by Commando 104B. As day breaks, the slightly less than 7,000 prisoners still alive at the main camp can hear artillery fire and explosions in the distance. As the day proceeds, the sounds of war grow closer. January 27th, 9 a.m. The Red Army units liberate Auschwitz III, Monowitz. Of the 850 sick prisoners left behind there, 650 are still alive. They are given food and treated by military doctors. Just before noon, the Red Army begins advancing on the main camp. By now, retreating Wehrmacht units have taken up position around the camp. The Soviets drive the German units further back in a short but intense battle. At 3 p.m., Soviet advanced troops enter the camp. Alexander Voronsov is a camera operator in the Soviet military film crew that records the liberation. He will remember. A ghastly sight arose before our eyes. A vast number of barracks in Birkenau. People lay in bunks inside many of them. They were skeletons clad in skin with vacant gazes. Of course, we spoke with them. However, these were brief conversations because these people who remained alive were totally devoid of strength and it was hard for them to say much about their time in the camp. When we talked with these people and explained to them who we were and why we had come here, they trusted us a bit more. The women wept, and this cannot be concealed. The men wept as well. You could say that there were pyramids on the grounds of the camp. Some were made up of accumulated clothing, others of pots, and others still of human jaws. 
I believe that not even the commanders of our army had any idea of the dimensions of the crime committed in this largest of camps. The memory has stayed with me my whole life long. Time has no sway over these recollections. It has not squeezed all the horrible things I saw and filmed out of my mind. For the prisoners still able to move, it is a moment of jubilation. Dr. Konyechna recalls how the prisoners rushed joyously towards them. Sometime later, a horse-drawn military column drove up in front of the blocks. When the Soviet soldiers realized what our situation was like, they supplied us with food of the highest quality, excellent army bread baked in pans, melba toast, and natural fats. A day or two later, several beautifully built Soviet officers, dressed in long, clean, white sheepskin coats, appeared and carried out a precise reconnaissance of our needs. The roughly 8,000 that the Red Army finds alive at Auschwitz and her subcamps are now among the 223,000 prisoners who have left the camp alive. Most were transported to other camps. Less than half of them will live to see the end of the war. Only 1,500 inmates were released from the camp during its five years of operation. About 500 managed to escape. The number of survivors are dwarfed by the number of dead. These are the numbers of people who arrived at the camp. 15,000 Soviet POW, 20,946 Sinti and Roma, 25,000 of varied nationality and ethnicity, at least 140,000 non-Jewish Poles, 690 Jewish Norwegians, 7,500 Jewish Italians, 10,000 Jewish Yugoslavians, 25,000 Jewish Belgians, 27,000 Jewish Czechoslovakians from Slovakia, 38,600 Jewish Germans and Austrians, 46,000 Jewish Czechoslovakians from Bohemia and Moravia, 55,000 Jewish Greeks, 60,000 Jewish Dutch, 69,000 Jewish French, 300,000 Jewish Poles, 438,000 Jewish Hungarians. All in all, 1.3 million arrivals, out of whom 400,207 were registered and enslaved in the camp. Out of them, 180,000 died in the camp, and 880,000 men, women, and children were murdered on arrival without registration. Out of the close to 1.1 million people murdered at Auschwitz, 15,000 were Soviet POW, 21,000 Sinti and Roma, 74,000 non-Jewish Poles, and 960,000 Jewish people from across Europe. During the 1,200 days of mass murder at the camp, close to 1,000 people were murdered every day. During the deportation of Jewish Hungarians in May and June 1944, the murders in the gas chambers peaked at over 15,000, with an average of 6,000 human beings exterminated every day. People with memories they were never allowed to share before their end, who had their lives full of sorrows and joys of existence stolen from them, only because they happened to be who they were. Brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, grandparents, uncles, aunts and cousins, children, infants, whose tears, smiles and laughter will never echo into the next generation, because that generation was murdered with them. Echoes now only heard at the liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, where the gas chambers and the crematoria lay in ruins and the ashes of a million people is in the dirt. An end that has not ended the suffering and never will. For the survivors, a deep, always burning scar was left on their souls. For the bereft, a gaping hole was left in their lives. For humanity, the camp will remain the gates that open on a deep chasm into our deepest depravities. For every act of hatred perpetuated again, for every murder of a man, woman, or child because of who they are, those gates are once again pried open a little more. Never forget. Thank you.